Good morning, afternoon, and evening to whoever is here today from wherever you are in the world. Um, I'm presenting this today uh, for, for FMC. They provided me with this uh, presentation, and I've added a few slides to it in the identification part. Um, and let's begin. Hopefully this system will work here. Okay, today's agenda then uh, are in three parts, uh, the keys to perimeter pest control, treatments, and common perimeter pests. Some of the pests uh, I don't consider pests, uh, especially some of the spiders. And so uh, you can just in enjoy the pictures of those and, and know what they are when you do find them. And in some cases, actually some species of spiders especially can be collected and there's a market an aftermarket for certain species of spiders uh, alive. Okay. Now, why is the exterior of a home key to gaining control? Let me get rid of this here. Um, first, pests originate outside. Food, water, and harborage are outside. You can, of course, get uh, occasional invaders that are coming from outside and by mistake, some of them are coming indoors. In some parts of the uh, uh, season, um, let's say in a fall to winter, some of these outdoor pests will uh, come inside as for overwintering. They're not really coming in for warmth, but they're coming in as they would outdoors, uh, staying in cracks and crevices, uh, under bark, uh, in, wall, in uh, rock walls and things. Uh, because if if these um, outdoor things, arachnids, uh, insects, are coming indoors and they were in warm areas, then they're using up their energy reserves and they'll die before the spring. So they're really looking for cold areas to stay in. Um, a well-protected exterior will keep out the majority of pests, which is true and uh, pesticide or insecticide applications are then needed and uh, remodeling or uh, doing other things to the, the outdoor envelope of your building uh, will reduce pests from coming indoors if you're closing off cracks you know closing off uh, space around uh, pipes uh, wiring that's coming in things like that so the exceptions uh, uh, were listed here, bed bugs, German cockroaches, uh, pantry pests, which would be moths and beetles, and closed moths, uh, tineid moths. And I did allude to this earlier, where do pests come from? Well, from the outside, they're going through cracks and openings in your building envelope, pipe wire penetrations, faulty screens, no screens, uh, faulty weather strips, missing weather strips, of course, and some of the uh, species will hitchhike on us. I I've seen that on indoors, actually, in clothes moths, walking into elevators, clothes moths would fly and go on the folds of the clothing on the coats and stay there. And that way they'd be brought to different floors in the building. The uh, how do we get control from the exterior? And obviously this starts with a very good inspection. That's the first key to control. So you're looking for conditions that favor pest activity. You have to locate the access, po access points, uh, locations that need modifications. So you're going to find those and tell the homeowner or business owner or a real estate person what has to be done. And you have to locate the pest resources, so that's food, water, and harborage. And knowing the pests, you would then know where you should look to find these things and what food they're eating, the moisture they need, and what types of harborage they would be getting into. Uh, everyone who's attending, and there's over 200, I see, um, there are very different tools that you have on your belt, in the backpack, in your truck that are needed for inspection. 
In some cases, you can't get to places, so obviously binoculars are very important. You can have a digital uh, pad for drawing, uh, cameras for taking pictures, phones for taking pictures, or the pads for taking pictures. You can even still use a pad and pencil or pen to write down information, uh, mirrors, flashlights, trowels, rakes, uh, an old um, uh, unit uh, tape measure is still very good. There's electronic ones, of course, and you may require ladders. Uh, graphing is extremely important. Uh, it's important for the overall picture of the property, helps figure costs, slows areas of activity and concern. Oh, sorry, not slows, shows area, areas of activity and concern. Great for the homeowner because you can show them exactly on a piece of paper, on graph paper, and even on digital uh, pad, you know, what's going on in their home and points of entry, um, issues um, with that building in with regard to a pest at entrance. Uh, it provides for efficient office communications. You might get fewer callbacks, Yes, you can have increased revenue and you can use Google Earth if you're showing uh, more graphics and images of the property as opposed to simply just a graph paper with numbers and lines on it. Points of entry, uh, you can see electrical, uh, gas conduit, electric conduits, water, pipes, all kinds of ways creatures can get into a building uh, cracks down in in the foundation, very many places. These are just a few examples. Uh, windows, uh, the uh, white rectangles pointing to the window, pointing to screens. Uh, shutters, you can have um, the, it, it, let's say the um, vent there uh, on this on this house, you know, didn't have screening behind it. So bats, there are parasites, uh, very many insects, wasps, uh, overwintering insects, you know, can get in very easily. So that that has to be examined. And it's important, of course, using your binoculars if you can't get there um, with a ladder, you can at least see. You can take close-up imaging if you have a uh, camera system hooked up to the binoculars or you just use the uh, telescopic view on a camera, zoom in. You also have soffit vents where blue arrows are. Uh, those have to be screened too, don't forget. Uh, you have also openings around flashing. You can see the blue arrows pointing, uh, screen on vent pipes, screen on chimney caps, which, which has a, a little white arrow there. And this shows you have concern for their home. Uh, more like the uh, soffit vents again, uh, gutters, check the gutters. You know, uh, commercials on TV about leaf filter uh, and blocking all the um, material that falls into a gutter that really blocks, dams up the gutter, water backs up, and you can have uh, plant growth in there. Uh, and you can have water then seeping up, depending on how much garbage is in there, um, and soaking up under the um, uh, roof system too, and the uh, wood system of, of the building. Uh, here's an issue you have, like I explained already, you have gutter gardening is a sign of poor moisture management and leads to pest harborage damage and other items. Uh, you can see in the two pictures, um, red arrows pointing to uh, the gutter issue and plants, of course, growing in the gutter and the siding of the house and uh, the painting is a little uh, needs uh, some looking into too, also. Uh, downspouts, this one's not too bad in that it's hitting the concrete 
or it could be concrete. Sometimes it may be plastic. Um, a system to drain water away from the foundation of the house. Sometimes people don't realize this, homeowners don't realize it. And if you look up, possibly this downspout is actually disconnected from the gutter and the water has just been pouring out, not going through the gutter at all. So don't forget to look up. Uh, here is conduit and wiring. Uh, many pests, if the system isn't sealed, you know, will simply crawl up on the wires and there can be rodents doing this too and crawling up into the house in this manner. Uh, there's patio and porch drains. And you can see that the um, uh, glass window wall door system uh, isn't sealed well against the flooring. And you also have an opening where the drain uh, system, uh, yeah, there's the arrow down in here. And pests can, of course, enter that way too. And don't be blinded by the obvious damage screens check under the sill. So there's a lot of just using your eyes to see what's going on in homes and buildings, very important. And don't forget to take pictures and note what's going on and then show that to the homeowner to explain your job can't be done properly if there's building issues, damage issues and disrepair issues in that structure. Uh, cracks in the walls and siding allow insect entry, as I noted before. And you can see in these pictures that ants are easily finding their way into the building uh, through cracks in the concrete wall. Um, don't forget grease traps. This would be something on this sealed up uh, uh, barbecue. And many things can live inside there especially if people just have these covered and really not using the barbecue that much. Um, mulch, um, leaves, uh, timber, ornamental timber, you know, used in the ground to hold a lot of the soil or mulch in place uh, does have a life. And if it does rot, you can have a lot of creatures living inside the rotted portions of the structure of the ozone those objects and in, in almost any geographic location here's more of a tropical location but tree limbs that touch a building allow entry of vertebrate and invertebrate pests into the structure sometimes unnoticed uh, because no one's been looking up and taking a look at what's going on with the vegetation around the building and up to the roof of the building and as you all know, if firewood's infested with ants, carpenter ants, uh, or different beetle species that may be in cut wood, and then these can be brought inside, of course, when the wood's brought in to be used in the fireplace. But also just if wood is, is uh, stored against the building rather than out in, its, in the open, and this one's on cinder blocks too, um, there's pests that would could be living in that stored wood and crawling into the building uh, at the backside of the wood that's against the wall of the building or of the home. And this is the hardest thing to get sometimes is homeowner cooperation. So if you take pictures and show the homeowner what's going on, what's wrong, what has to be looked after by that homeowner, it often will help to get you assistance in your pest management techniques around the home. Of course, some people might see this and be annoyed and bothered by you showing them what they're not doing well, uh, but that's a problem in doing business. So homeowner cooperation is essential to gaining control, reduce callbacks, possible revenue generator, and increases, uh, increases customer satisfaction. And that's what we're striving for. Uh, perimeter control elements, let me move stuff around on my screen, uh, apply residual insecticide band around the perimeter, treat cracks and crevices, treat entry points, treat pest trails, nest sites, you modify the habitat, seal cracks and other entry points, 
And remember, pesticide application is not the service. Your knowledge is the service. Uh, key two is calibration. What is calibration? To determine the correct range for an artillery gun or mortar by observing where it hits. Well, we're not using artillery guns or mortars, but we do have application methods. Uh, the same is true for applying insecticides, but a bit more. You need to know where it goes and how much goes there. So how to calibrate a sprayer. A hand sprayer, you fill the sprayer with a known quantity of water, let's say one gallon, pump it to a known pressure. If you have a gauge on there, you can pick uh, 20 pounds per square inch and use it. If no pressure gauge, simply pump it up a set number of times, let's say 10 pumps, select the tip you're going to use, a fine fan, coarse fan, etc. And coarse fan is highlighted here. Uh, with the sprayer now ready to go, make a single spray walking as you normally would with the spray wand at normal height to measure how wide the spray pattern is. Stop and measure the width, which should be around two feet. Now measure out a known area, so you're using your tape measure uh, in this way, uh, 100 square feet wide as one pass of the sprayer. Uh, so it would be like two feet times uh, wide times a 50 foot length gives you 100 square feet. And here is a measured area that's supposed to be that 100 square feet. Now you calibrate. So with the water, sorry, with the sprayer now set to a known PSI with a known quantity of water, you're ready to calibrate. You start at one end of that two by 50 foot area, which was marked in red in the previous slide. You use a stopwatch to measure the time it takes to spray. You're walking in a normal manner and you spray that area. Mark, time, mark down the time it took to stop and start and stop the application. Measure out how much water was applied on each pass by pouring out the remaining water into a tank, in that tank, and into a measuring device in, let's say, a gallon uh, incremental um, container. Uh, then subtract the amount from the one gallon you started with. You do this three times to get, hopefully, very much the same answer three times. So if you look at the data, the attempt one, it was 12 seconds, you went 2.84 miles per hour. You did 100 uh, volume of 14 fluid ounces per 100 square feet. And the volume is 140 by, um, per 1,000 square feet. So here, the data shows you're putting out an average of 125 fluid ounces per 1,000 square feet. And a gallon is 128 fluid ounces, as you know. Uh, you're using approximately, by three fluid ounce difference, uh, one gallon per 1,000 square feet. Each technician needs to calibrate their own volumes, and you time the application to ensure you're being consistent. Pin streams are uh, different. Uh, based on, and the person who wrote this said, my trials, pin stream application puts out approximately 4.33 gallons for every thousand square feet based on a one inch wide treatment. This simulated treatment uh, around a window, most labels only allow for a one inch wide treatment band around windows and doors. You can calibrate the same way as we did before in the fan spray. So here's a perimeter pest equipment needs and you may have one or all of these items, depending what type of work you do. So you may have a spray rig, backpack sprayer, backpack mist blower, uh, and spreader for granules. Uh, perimeter pest management, uh, you're looking and controlling these different areas of your building, the base of the foundation, the foliage around the property, soffits, you're going around windows and doors, and you're placing baits strategically not to place them where you're going to spray a uh, chemical insecticide or pesticide. And don't spray them, uh, bait systems, by accident 
after you've applied them and place them where you want them to go. Now, these are different pest hiding places, which many of you and all of you obviously know from doing this type of work in the shrubbery and trees at the base around the building and up at the gutters and soffit area, for example, are places. Uh, granular applications, you have to also calibrate is an unknown, a certain number of pounds per 1,000 square feet. Some will give the settings on the product label. And typically, this is a 10-foot wide spray of granules when you're applying. Now we're getting into the common perimeter pests. Um, in some cases, uh, some uh, black widows are considered pests. Some people keep them as pets. I've had them as pets. And I know people have kept them and been bitten by them. Uh, and they've had a uh, um, pain from the bite. Um, and it lasted a few hours. It lasted maybe a day, day and a half. The swelling went down and then they were fine. It depends how much venom, of course, is injected with the bite. And if you have a reaction or a hypersensitive reaction to spider venoms. Uh, the, the characteristic red marking or hourglass is on the belly of the spider. And you see that because theridiid spiders, the cobweb weavers and, and the widows specifically here, uh, are upside down in a web. So that's why you see that marking on the belly and the uh, hourglass marking on a widow. It's not on the dorsum. Uh, there's a, different markings on immatures and the male widow spiders and different species of widow spiders may have some dorsal markings also. Uh, the Harbridge, the uh, southern black widow, um, prefers dark sheltered areas. Uh, webs are in hollow logs under loose bark or stones. Uh, you, you probably have read this uh, information while I've been speaking, so we'll go to another one. This is the brown widow, the egg sac, is very distinctive in a, having these spikes all over it. Of course, the coloration of the spider is distinctive. And you can see the uh, orange hourglass on the venter of this female widow here. Some of the um, widow spiders are known to even capture small lizards and old lizards I've seen. Um, but normally, they're feeding on various insects that get caught in the web. I put an ogre face spider in uh, just to show that this spider hunts at night, basically upside down, hanging down, and forms a little web, like a, a fishing web, that it tosses on insects underneath it, beetles and ants, let's say. You notice the eyes are very big, but this is the second row of eyes in the spider, and these are very enlarged, and they're good for night vision. On jumping spiders, which I'll show net later, it's the front two eyes, which are small in a um, ogre face spider and many other spiders as well. And in jumping spiders, which I'll show later, these front two eyes are very distinctive in spiders, the anterior medians, because they have the retina that can be moved back and forth in their eye. And that's how they're focusing uh, so those jumping spiders are good at focusing and good vision. The ogre face is a preset distance and very large posterior median eyes, and they're good for night vision. A uh, woodlouse hunter you might find outdoors. They have six eyes and then they oval shape on the front of the carapace. You don't notice also much of any cervical groove, which is usually typically in spiders. The cervical groove is the, uh, on the inside of the carapace, the top section of the spider, the cervical groove is extended inside, and that's where muscle attachment is that goes to the sucking stomach. But in these dysterid spiders or woodlouse hunters, uh, you don't see that. It looks quite smooth. And the chelicerae are, are elongated, stuck out forward, and the fangs are very long. Uh, both of these fangs are not so much needed to pierce the isopod or the woodlouse because 
uh, and through the skeleton, the exoskeleton of that creature, they're actually putting only one into a membrane between the sclerites, the hardened plates of the isopod. That's how they they uh, hunt those animals. And they also do feed on other spiders too. A southern house spider you might find um, outdoors or inside the house. They have a very distinctive, the female has a very distinctive body shape, legs that really don't have any CD, uh, macro CD or spines. Uh, they have a close set area of eyes and the male, which is the center picture here, has a very elongate uh, sections of the pedipalp. The pedipalps of spiders are modified in males for transferring sperm. And the uh, webbing, they're called southern house spiders or crevice spiders, um, a very distinctive cribellate silk, which means it has an extra series of um, spigots in the front, as you see down here, and a certain comb or little teeth on the hind legs of the spider that are used to fluff this uh, spider uh, spider silk up. A recluse spider, you see it has six eyes, but it has them in three sets of two, three dyads. Uh, the male structure and palp here is distinctive for loxoceles or recluse spiders. And spitting spiders also have six eyes. They have a high domed carapace in front and uh, they produce um, uh, venom, liquid venom and liquid silk in glands in the front. So they're actually spitting in a crisscross um, Z-shaped kind of strips when the spider is shooting this forward from the fangs of the clissary and sticking down the prey item, the uh, stickiness of that silk, uh, well, of the, of the saliva, uh, holds that creature down and the venom that's in there also penetrates and knocks out the prey item. Uh, wolf spiders, or many species of wolf spiders in the US, uh, some will feed on small vertebrates, um, although most are arthropod feeding creatures. Uh, they have a very distinctive eye arrangement. And I'll show a few pictures later. They have eight eyes and four in the front row, two in the second, two behind that. Uh, females um, carry the egg sac on the spinnerets. When the young hatch, they crawl on the body of the spider. And you could see the eye arrangement here pretty much. Um, you can also see in some of the wolf spiders, uh, there are dark and light striping on the carapace. And some people um, confuse that striping with the funnel web weavers, which I'll also show, but it's actually a different coloring striping. And uh, the picture here of the wolf spider eye show you the eye arrangement I was talking about. This shows the dark and light striping of this particular wolf spider and the eye arrangement. This is a pardosa here, so it's a little different shape to the carapace, but you can still understand the way the eye arrangement is. It's, it's good in the positioning of these eyes, it's for a movement and they can pick up movement of creatures uh, like 180 degrees or further around their body because the, the uh, prey items or predators will be moving and it's picked up by different sets of eyes depending where that creature is at the time. The funnel weavers, oh, and funnel weavers uh, are these Agilented spiders. They have a the Agilinopsis genus. The species have very long spinnerets you can see here. Um, they have the particular striping on the carapace. The eye arrangement is totally different from wolf spiders. And by the way, there is a funnel web wolf spider, genus Sosipus, and that particular wolf spider does produce a funnel web. Its spinnerets are a bit longer than a typical wolf spider spinnerets. They're in our south and western part of the U.S. And there's other species in of the same of the of the uh, subfamily. Uh, hip, hip uh that do also produce 
funnel webs, even though it's a wolf spider. The uh, different eye arrangement here, you can see these are um, pro-curved eye rows in that the anterior medians have the anterior laterals forward of them. The posterior medians also have the posterior ladder, lateral eyes forward too. This is distinctive for the Agilented uh, Agilinopsis and some other Agilented spiders. And typically, yes, they live inside a funnel, the tube part of the funnel. Uh, things that fall on this more or less horizontal web are captured uh, because the web is, of course, transmitting information to the spider as to its feet, tarsi, that are on the web, and it knows to cr run out fast it uses the long spinnerets and a lot of sheet uh, silk production uh, to tie down the uh, prey item. Then it goes and bites it. We have web building spiders, a nephila on the right, argiope uh, down the middle. We have gastrocantha, microthena, leucalgi, and arrhenius uh, pictured here. These are things you'll find outdoors. Um, uh, web building spiders. You have sheet web builders. These are sort of horizontal sheets, possibly with three-dimensional silk above. And these are small, um, you know, eighth of an inch, quarter inch, maybe or so long spiders. You can see the male uh, lindifeid spider here with its modified palp for uh, mating purposes. You'll have link spiders, a very distinctive eye arrangement of two in the front, and then you have an hexagonal or six-sided shape to the eye pattern behind that. These are uh, spiders that aren't producing uh, webs. They may produce silk, of course, obviously, and uh, they're good hunters on vegetation. Uh, jumping spiders, you can see the anterior median eyes are the enlarged eyes on a jumping spider. And if you ever uh, captured any and watched any, and they look at you because their vision's quite good. You'll see a fluttering going on in the eye itself and the anterior median eyes, and that's the retina moving back and forth for them to focus on you. Uh, many of those also are ant mimics and pretty good ant mimics. But put a few in there. So now we're into ticks. Uh, this is a drawing of Exodi scapularis, a deer tick or black legged tick. And you'll see the larva of a, larva of a tick is six legs. Uh, in most um, mites, you'll, in general, you'll see six-legged larvae. The nymph, the next stage is eight-legged. Then you have an adult male and female. Um, the uh, adult male has a large scute on its back, female a small scute. I put these pictures in to show you the pictures of, of actual specimens, and you could see the mouth parts. This is the uh, palps, a uh, 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 mouth part section. Uh, internally, you can see on this larva, the central area, there are two chalicerae there, which are the same type chalicerae as a spider has. They're just modified to a totally different shaping. And you also have a hypostome, which is the underneath point, uh, sort of like the tongue you can think of, of a, of a hard tick. And the hard ticks have usually recurved teeth on the hypostome and that gets pushed into the host. It anchors it better. Some ticks produce a cement that makes sure it gets anchored into their host and they stay for hours feeding. The uh, male tick feeds for less time. Uh, this is American dog tick. You can see from the pictures that the uh, palps are different, the base, the capitulum, the front part of the tick is different. The skewed is different from the exodes tick I showed earlier. And you can see the large uh, skewed of the adult male back here. These also have what are called um, the, the structures in the back of the tick. Some have them, some don't. Uh, here's a picture of the uh, dog tick, male, female, the nymph, and the larval stage. You notice the stubby um, 
structures of the mouth parts compared to exodes ticks. So germicenter has stubby ones. And these, uh, I didn't mention earlier, these are called festoons on the back end. In some tick species, you can see they're, they are segmented structures in, in plates, segmented plates. A Gulf Coast tick, which some people have found, uh, it's a different genus, amblyoma, instead of dermacenter, instead of exodes. But you see the scute of the female is modeled a bit like dermacenter. Um, but the mouth parts are very stubby in this, like I said, in dermacenter, and elongated in amblyoma. These also have festoons on the back. And lone star tick has elongated mouth part. Lone star refers to the white dot on the posterior edge of the scutum of the female. These also have festoons around the rear section that you can see very easily in adults and a large scute on the male. Uh, and sometimes you'll even get mites outdoors. In fact, many times you'll get mites outdoors. Some of these crawl in. This is a clover mite. It's very distinctive body and very long front legs. The other uh, mites here are uh, adults that are not parasitic, they're predaceous, but the immatures of erythraean mites uh, and leptis, belustium, they're parasitic on insects and other arthropods. You might even find daddy long legs uh, with red dots on their legs. These are parasitic uh, leptis, usually um, mites, feeding on the hemocylic fluid of that apilionid of the daddy long legs. Uh, cockroaches, here's an American cockroach. Okay. Um, you usually find these, of course, in wet areas, sometimes in basements, sewers, and things like that. Outdoors, it explains here that they're in mulch bed, wooden, grassy areas, higher moisture levels. And indoors, as I said earlier, uh, but, but they'll come into commercial kitchens, obviously, too. I put a picture of different cockroaches you might find, even though they're not really outdoor pests, such as a brown banded, but just to show, you know, what comparison you have uh, to other species that might be found outdoors. Uh, German, not so much, but a related species, same genus, you will. And um, Sorry, also look at the egg capsules, the oothica of cockroaches. You'll see how sclerotized, hardened up American Oriental and Brown Bandit are, but German, not so much. And if you look at these other Blatella species, introduced species, to, uh, in addition, obviously, to the German that's introduced here, but you'll see the generalized striping on the pronotum is sort of distinct on a German, not so distinct on an Asian. And then looking at Platella vega, you see it's very distinct. And in some parts of the country, you'll be getting these other Platella species. They're typically an outdoor species. Uh, this one here, typically a, even attracted to lighting and they'll fly compared to a German, which can fly, but isn't really attracted to lighting. I just wanted to show you the Oothica, these Platella species carry the oothica almost to the point and sometimes to the point of hatching and you'll notice on oothica of blatella the outer section of it is sclerotized the inner area is less sclerotized that's because the female isn't just carrying her egg case around because she likes to but she's also transferring water from within her body to the less sclerotized section of the egg case, and that gives that egg case water it needs for metabolism of the yolks in the eggs where these uh, young nymphs are developing. Uh, a brown marmorated stink bug, Haliomorpha halis, an introduced species, um, is very distinctive white and black markings on the antenna. The interesting marks around the outer edge, which occurs in other bugs as well, the light and dark markings. And these are you're going to be treating outdoors in the fall because often in the 
uh, certain sides of buildings, usually a uh, northern area of the building, I believe, uh, where you'll have these bugs because of the sun hitting it. They're waiting there. And then they find cracks and crevices through which they can gain access to buildings, to soffits, to attics. If they get into a warmer area of the house, uh, they're going to be very active and they'll die off early because they're using their energy reserves up. Uh, some people find these obviously a lot in their house and they think they have bed bugs, but you can see you can comparison I made to bed bug bodies that the uh, coloration, striping, every morphology of body parts of Halliomorpha halles is very different from Simex lectularis. A Western conifer seed bug is another insect you may find, may probably most likely find. Um, coming into the home uh, because they want to overwinter also. They'll be very active if they're in a warm area of the home um, and they're using their food reserves up and they'll die off for spring. If they stay, as in other overwintering insects, if they stay in a cold area, then they will make it to next spring, emerge. And you have to do inspections to see, you know, how are they, you might have to go in the attic, obviously, and look out to see how are they getting in these places those can be sealed up uh and there's one case i know of where this bug has bitten a person and here's a reference to it from the journal of medical entomology in 2017. uh you can have asian lady beetles coming in um these are also introduced species they have a sort of a characteristic look to them but as you see from these pictures this is the Asian lady beetle, and this is a polymorphic species. Uh, it looks can look very different from what you think of an Asian lady beetle looks like, but it's actually the same species, no difference. Typically, there's an M or W shape on the pronotum. Uh, you can't see it too well, obviously, on this darkened specimen here, but it is uh, sort of obvious on all the other specimens. And also a ladybird beetle. Some people misidentify abdomens when these parts or insects have been found or parts thereof been found in the home and they're thought that they're bed bug bodies. But you can see that in this, you have this extension of the um, one abdominal segment, which bed bugs don't have. And a bed bugs ventral view, as you see here, uh, you can what happens is it's a very membranous area on a bed bug. It covers a few abdominal sternites, the underneath section of the bed bug, and that's extendable. This is a membrane and allows for expansion of the body during feeding and also egg production in females. The dark area isn't blood, even though in bed bugs, a dark area would be internal in the gut, and that would be digesting blood of that bed bug. Uh, pill bugs, these are isopods. Um, these pill bugs in particular are ones that can roll up into a ball. Many other um, sorry, isopods, uh, they usually have extensions off the rear end of the body uh, down here. And typically those can't roll up into a night sphere like, uh, like the uh, pill bug can. And isopods also, uh, are kept as pets, and uh, many of them have very many colorful parts on it. Um, and this is a molting one. The young isopods are feeding on the shed skin of this adult isopod here. And centipedes, multi-legged animals, uh, typically uh, one pair of legs one uh, per body segment. Uh, house centipede, uh, scolopendromorph centipedes uh, below. And you can see the house centipede is very distinctive. It has compound eyes, which look like insect compound eyes, but they're different. And you also have the um, centipedes, the venom in induction area are the forcipules or maxilla. Well, forcipules is a good word for it. And it's modified front legs, venom glands inside, and pointed fang-like structures at the tip 
So they have chewing mouth parts. They inject venom and then chew up their prey, which varies from many kinds of arthropods to spiders, um, to other centipedes sometimes. Uh, centipedes have maternal behavior. The female wraps around her egg mass and takes care of them that way. Uh, millipedes are typically uh, have two pair of legs per body segment, not so much the front few segments as uh, you can see here. Those are single. The reproductive structure in males and females uh, in this area on the ventral part of the millipede. And um, not all are tubular in cross section. Many of these can feed on plant material. Centipedes are obviously predaceous. Millipedes are not so much predaceous. There are some millipedes that are predaceous, however, not in the US as far as I know. They will feed on carrion and corpses. Uh, so you can find them there also, not just on vegetation and rotting vegetation. And not all millipedes are tubular in shape as you can see here. And some are not all brown. They can have many different colors. These are good chemical production uh, animals producing cyanide, hydroquinones, um, and other chemicals to ward off uh, annoying people and predators. So the last slide I'm getting into here uh, are pitfalls in doing our perimeter pest control. So you have to walk around the property as we pointed out before and looking at areas but now you have to look at uh, hazards. And this slide would have been good to have in the front, I think. But you have fish ponds, bird bath, pet food, pets, people who might be milling around next door if you're doing applications or uh, on a porch or, or some area in that home you're working on. Open windows and doors, that's not good for pesticide drift. Open wells, also not good. You don't want to fall in them. Toys you can trip on, other tripping hazard, vegetable gardens, fruit trees, etc. So with, with that, I guess this is finished. Well, thank you, Lou, for a great presentation on perimeter pests. Uh, appreciate everyone attending. You know today's February installment of FMC First Friday. Hope everyone has a uh, great weekend and uh, enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Take Thanks. care. Thanks, Bye. Lou. You're welcome. Bye.